tell you your actual real age, not your chronological age. I mean, birthdays, who cares? Number of times the Earth's gone around the sun, are you kidding me? That's not your real age. What your real age is, is there's changes to the epigenome that determine how old you really are. Healthy, but our brains still age. So what we've ended up with are, and just to use my grandmother as an example, a nation of elderly whose hearts are working well, for example, but their brains are no longer functioning. And this is a major problem for our healthcare system. It's extremely, extremely expensive. What we need are medicines that will keep all of our body's parts working at the same time. And if we just if we just fix one part of our body, the problem is that some other part will break down. We're just switching out diseases. And I don't think this is the right way to go about it. If you look at this graph, actually, this really brings it home. Now, we're always taught that our medicines are making us healthier for longer. That's not true. Look at this graph. The amount of time that we are spending in good health is actually decreasing in terms of percentage. No wonder healthcare costs are going up. What we need to do, of course, is to keep us healthier for longer. So I'm not talking about living for 500 years. I see that sometimes quoted in the press. But what I am talking about is an ability for us to live into our 90s and our hundreds in a healthy way, and not like my grandmother who suffers, and many of us will go through this unless we do something about the root cause of aging. And I would argue is the greatest problem of our time. Well, let me tell you about the work that I've been doing a little bit about how I think we can get at the root cause of aging. So when I was in my 20s, uh, I earned a PhD in Sydney and I headed off to Boston to a place called MIT to understand why yeast cells, little budding yeast that we use to make bread and beer, why they grow old. Because I figured if we couldn't figure this, this out for a yeast cell, we had no hope of understanding why we grow old. Fortunately, I did. And even though there were critics of this approach, the critics, there were even Nobel Prize winners who, who told me, uh, you know, this is not the way to go about aging. Yeast cells don't get gray hair. They don't get heart disease. They don't get cancer. But I ignored them, fortunately. Uh, I was quite naive. Um, luckily. And we, in the next few years, what we discovered as a group was that yeast cells do in fact grow old. And one of the reasons is that their genes start to switch on as they get older. So what I mean by that is that so every cell has a set number of genes. We all know that. In every one of your cells, same number of genes. But they're not all switched on at the same time. They need to be kept on and off, tell what type of cell is in the liver and what type of cell is in the brain. And what we found was that these yeast cells, as they got older, after about a week, all the genes started to come on and they died. Now we could find genes that could actually slow that process down. We could find genes that could switch off those rogue genes and silence them. And this led to a discovery of a longevity gene called SIR2. And SIR2 stands for Silent Information Regulator Number 2. We used to think that antioxidants were the cure to aging. And if you go to the supermarket, you'll still get a lot of that bull. It's not true. Antioxidants have been really unsuccessful at lengthening the lifespan of anything, even a worm. It doesn't work that well. The reason is that there's much more going on than just free radical damage. What we need to do is to tap into our body's natural defenses against aging. We have three main sets of defenses. One's called mTOR, response to fasting. One called AMPK, response to low energy and lack of sugar. You want to keep your blood sugar levels low as possible without fainting. And the group of genes that I work on are called the sirtuins, and they respond to all of the things that we do, the adversity, the exercise, the fasting. And this group of genes and these proteins that the genes make sense the environment. And when times are thought to be tough and could threaten us, they fight harder to keep our body safe, protected, and ultimately healthier and longer lived even late in life. And what they're doing, these sirtuins, is controlling this structure here. They're doing a lot of things, I should say, but the main thing that I believe they're doing to make us live longer is controlling what we call the epigenome. If you haven't heard of the epigenome, think of it like this. We have DNA. I'm showing you it as a, as a blue strand. It's digital information, A, T, C, G. There's four bases. It's base four, it's not base two or binary. The epigenome is not digital. It's mostly analog. And anyone who's old enough to have had an analog device, whether it's a tape recorder or a record player, a record, these things get disrupted. They get scratched. It's very bad, very poor at copying information. And that's true for the epigenome as well. Copying epigenetic information doesn't work that well. But what is the epigenome? It's the structures that wrap up the DNA and say, say that this gene A should be on in a brain cell, but in a liver cell should be off. And this gene B should be off in a skin cell, but should be on in a kidney. That's the epigenome. And largely it's due to the three dimensional structures of the folding of DNA. And these sirtuins that defend us are called silent information regulators. That's what sirtuins actually stand for, S-I-R. And two is the number two for the first gene in yeast that we showed extended life 
lifespan way back in Lenny Guarantee's lab at MIT in the 1990s. But here's the analogy that the DNA is the digital information on a compact disc. Those of us who are old enough know what that is. For the youngsters, this is what we used to store 20 songs on. It was great technology. That's your genome, the digital information. The epigenome is the reader and it can read different songs depending on different parts of the body and different cell types. But what I believe is causing aging is the skipping of those songs, skipping of the reader. And what makes songs skip? Scratches. So aging is essentially scratches on a compact disc that makes the music skip. And eventually cells, by reading the wrong genes, skipping the wrong genes, lose their ability to fight against disease. They lose their function. We get dementia, we get heart disease, we get cancer, we get frailty. That is aging. So with this new theory of what I call the information theory of aging, we can perhaps test this by testing if epigenetic changes cause aging. And if that's true, is, there, is it possible to reset these structures back to being young? Is there a backup copy of the epigenome? In other words, can you polish that CD and get back the original music value? Before I go on, I want to point out, in this structure, there's something really important. It's not just the proteins that wrap up the DNA, but the modifications that are on the DNA itself. Chemical additions called methyls. Methyls are carbons with three hydrogens. They're very simple. And cells add them as we're developing in the, in the womb to say, all right, that cell sh that's come from stem cells should be a neuron for 80, 90, 100 years in the brain, and this one should be a skin cell. These marks called methyls dictate the production of 26 billion cells that many of them have different functions in the body, even though they have the same set of instructions encoded in the DNA. What's been found since 2013, Stephen Horvath and his colleagues discovered that by reading the changes over time of these DNA methylation marks on the DNA that are attached to the, the, the letter C in the DNA, not the A, or G, you can estimate somebody's biological age because it's reproducible. We're all aging due to the same mechanisms and that there's a pattern that occurs from conception very rapidly until we're born and then slows down and then is linear throughout our lifespan. We can measure that clock. I can take your blood, I can take your skin, any part of your body, and I can run that through what's called a DNA sequencer, measure the methylation, there's thousands of them, and putting that into a machine learning derived algorithm, I can tell you your actual real age, not your chronological age, I mean birthdays, who cares? Number of times the earth's gone around the sun, are you kidding me? That's not your real age. What your real age is, is this changes to the epigenome that determine how old you really are. Exercise isn't just beneficial for your fitness and for your vitality. It actually can stop diseases in their tracks. Um, exercise can slow down cancer. In fact, it can prevent up to 23% of all cancers from occurring. Um, that's true for cardiovascular disease. In fact, it has an even bigger effect on that. 30% reduction just by doing moderate exercise every week. 50 minutes is, is sufficient or three times a week with 10 minutes. All cause mortality, right? So what we have, all cause mortality is, based, mortality is basically slowing down aging. That's a 27% reduction in the rate of aging just by exercising. One of the things that I do, one of the probably the, the best thing I could tell you having read thousands of scientific papers is eat less often. Now that's not malnutrition, it's not starvation, but it does mean going hungry for part of the day. What I do is I skip breakfast, I eat a late lunch, sometimes I miss lunch uh, and eat a normal dinner. What does that do? That turns on these longevity pathways. It raises the NAD levels in our body, which NMN will do also, and it will mimic exercise and hunger. Well, hunger will of course mimic hunger, but NMN and hunger work through these same longevity pathways. And you might find that by exercising a bit like these mice, getting yourself puffed a few days a week on a treadmill just for 10 minutes is enough, and being hungry for a few days out of the week, you'll find you feel remarkably better um, and you'll be a lot fitter because of it. And perhaps when you're 80, 90, and even 100, you'll be able to continue doing all the things you always have wanted to do late in life. Um, start a new career if you want, start a new company, leaving a legacy.